of this message, we'll understand even that title a little bit more, but more importantly, we'll be inspired and encouraged about the future of the Ottawa Church and our lives in Christ. Melanie shared with you a little bit the eventful last few days, couple of weeks that it's been for the Singh family. Absolutely thrilling on many, many fronts. Of course, it's always sad to say goodbye to a family member, uh, yet uh, we all know that's obviously part of life. I want to share with you a little bit about where we're going for the next few months. Amazingly, Melly and I have been here for two months. In some ways, that seems, wow, it's been only two months. In some ways, it's been, wow, it's been two months already. And so it's been really incredible uh, to be here, and I want to share with you what we're going to be doing. Uh, we're excited that uh, of the next few weeks after today, over about a 14-week uh, period, there are going to be 10 lessons on 10 epic b battles in the scriptures. And the idea of that is going to be that when we see how God wins every victory, it will inspire us and to think about what the future holds for all of us if we were to remain faithful to him. He will always win, with or without you and I, and that's humbling. But I know I want to be on a winning side. And so we're going to look at some of those stories, and it's going to culminate on the greatest battle of them all is God's victory over sin on Easter. That epic battle that was won, and it provides salvation for all of us. And the idea that we're going to be doing on that Sunday, we'll have a time, a very symbolic time. A symbolic time in the sense that we're going to have a time of dedication, a day of atonement, if you would. New Testament atonement, okay? where we're going to say, as a church, we're putting our sins in the past, we're nailing them to the cross, and we're going to come not only individually, while there need to be individual repentance in all of our lives, but there's going to be the corporate repentance. And that as we go forward, we know Christ has won the victory and our sins have been forgiven, yet on that day we will have a day of dedication. And that we will be inspired and encouraged in our hearts after we've seen all these victories that ultimately culminates on that great day. And so we're going to talk about that. Amen? Amen. Pray. And what I'm going to do, you look out in your news uh, letter, I'm going to give you the scriptures uh, the, the epic battle that's going to be, we're going to be talking about on the next Sunday, so you can read about beforehand. You could come in already prepared in a manner of speaking to be encouraged and inspired. What epic battle are we going to talk about today? And so that we can, as a congregation, be in our hearts synced up as we talk about the great victories that God is going to win. You know, um, just some, you know, some details. Um, starting next week, we are going to, uh, you know, one of the things that you may have noticed, that we, we're going to start at 1030 every Sunday, meaning oh, the worship begins before that. Hopefully your worship begins even before that. But as a congregation or corporate worship, We'll come together, we'll start at 10.30. At 10.25, we will have, for a lack of a better term, a countdown. I know we're going to be involved in fellowship, amen. I love interrupting your fellowship. That's a healthy sign of a congregation. Amen, we are fellowshipping, we can't pull, we can't, we got to pull each other away from, uh, uh, from each other. That's a, that's a good thing. 
But you will understand if you're having coffee tonight, next Sunday, we'll have coffee uh, 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 before church uh, at service so we can come in and uh, you don't have to stop at Starbucks or Tim Hurton or wherever you are, you, your choice of coffee or tea. So we'll have that on Sunday morning so you can come in here and have a great fellowship, begin our worship uh, earlier than expected. Um, and, and then at 1025, we'll have a countdown. So at 1030, we're all ready to go. Amen. Amen. And so, um, and so that 1030 would mean something, you know, and it's not just an arbitrary uh, time, but it means something for what we're going to be doing. So I really want to encourage you that some of the things that we are going to be doing. <coughs> Yesterday was a, a part of the busy um, season that we had. Uh, we went to pick up our grandson. And, um, and our grandson, we picked him up uh, in, of all places, Stony Creek. Why, what was he doing in Stony Creek, you're asking? Well, actually, uh, for uh, the other grandparents and, uh, and his father, we met there uh, to help them out a little bit uh, as they were driving in from a fair distance. So we stopped at an obscure place in Stony Creek. As a matter of fact, this place was so obscure, the roads were not yet done. Some of the buildings that were being put up had not yet been completed. They were not open. But of course, faithful Costco was open, okay? And so, uh, and there was Starbucks there as well. Your faithful Costco and Starbucks were already open. And so we got there and uh, we met, we, we're sitting down at, uh, at Starbucks. Melanie and I are sitting down waiting for uh, our cute grandson to come. So we, we haven't seen him for a while. So we were really excited having our mocha frappuccino and baby, you had tea. Yes, uh, of course. She's addicted to teas. If someone could help her with that, amen to that. Uh, but uh, uh, so we're sitting there, and um, after about, oh, 20, 25 minutes, literally out of the blue, there's this guy comes right up to me, to both of us, but to me in particular, and Melanie's sitting across from the table, and he says, are you Tony Singh? I said, I am. I already paid the bill. <laughs> he said, no, I know you because um, I, I, I sat down and he was a part of the congregation many years ago in Toronto. And he said to me, he said, you don't look any different. I said, you need new glasses. <laughs> he goes on to say that uh, with uh, many kind words that he says, I've always told people that there is the greatest preacher in the world. So I gave him five bucks when he said that. <laughs> he said he'd been so encouraged and inspired just to see us sitting there. It's amazing where you can go in the more obscure places. And someone comes up and says, and it's actually a little disheart a little frightening. <laughs> Are you, Tony? Because I did not know who this person was. He went on to tell us a little bit about his history in the Toronto church and was very, very encouraged and is now uh, living in the Beamsville area um, and, um, and went on to ask some questions and so on and so forth. And he, he remarked a few times how encouraged he was to see us. I tell us we actually now live in Ottawa and he was very encouraged to hear that. That moment brought for me a confirmation. A confirmation that God is not done with us in this nation. That you can go to the ends of the earth if you would. Literally, there are no homes there. I'm not even, there are no homes there. They're not building homes. And there we are going there and God says, I have many people in this province. We are not done yet. Next year, we will be celebrating our 25th year in the Ottawa Church. 25 years. 
As a matter of fact, I remember as if it were yesterday when we planted, and I use that word, planted the Ottawa church. As a matter of fact, it was, it was with much expectation. We talked about how God was going to do great things in this city, and hopefully we would be the people that God would at least use for some of those great things. And I am confident, ultimately, when we see what God has done, we will see the great victories. And yet, if we were to be honest, we've had some challenges in this family. Every family has challenges. And we've had some family, and there's some of us that are discouraged in our faith, as Melanie and I have been making the rounds and going around and meeting with a lot of people. Some of us are just absolutely excited and thrilled about where they're at and the, uh, uh, the future, and some of us in our journey has been a little challenging, actually a lot challenging. As a matter of fact, let's be honest. There are some people that we have met with that, and not one, more than one, that uh, had said, there are times that I was so discouraged in my faith, I would rather stay home than be with the family of God. Not because I was sick, or there was even a good game on television, but simply I did not want to go, because it would hurt me more in my faith for me to go than for me to stay home. That it would hurt me more in my faith to be with the people who would judge angels. To be with people who, with whom the Son of God died for. To be with people for whom the plan of salvation came to fruition in their lives. And, and yet, as I heard those words, it was so sobering. Because you know what? There are times I felt like that. In my walk with God over 32 years. And if we were not to, to be honest with ourselves, <coughs> And to realize there are some things that we have got to deal with. But I think the number one thing is, that to, is for us to have a vision of what God can do in our lives. What God wants to do in our lives. And that we are not buried, but we are people who have been planted. Because when you bury something and you plant something, it starts out the same way. They're both underground. And we're going to look at, in a few moments, that whole idea. <coughs> and that when we celebrate our 25th year, next year, that it will be such a jubilation and such an encouragement because we indeed will realize what God has done with the plant of the Ottawa church and how it blossoms even more beautiful than the tulips in the, in the springtime in Ottawa. That as a matter of fact, it will pale in comparison. Someone will say, it is not even worth it to go watch the tulips because they're so ugly relative to what God has done with the Ottawa church. But before we can see that, We've got to examine our lives and come to some honest evaluations. And to see how God sees us. And to have the idea that God is ready to do some great things with us. In John chapter 12, in John chapter 12, we read about a concept that when we were to think about it, it really is quite simple. By the way, the idea of buried or planted was not my own. I wish it was. 
I actually, interestingly, was watching a sports program, and if you know me anything, I need help with that. I love sports. I mean, and my wife would say to me, honey, did you not just watch that game? Why are you watching the highlights? She said, do you think there was something missed, that you missed something in the game or something happened that you missed? Because you watched the whole game. I said, honey, you'll never understand. <laughs> and it's worse when I watch the same highlights three or four times, especially when your team wins, right? It's just, it brings you so much joy. Anyways, that's my issue. I've got to see counseling about it. Amen to that. But the idea is, I was watching a sports show, and, and, and that, that phrase was said, buried or planted. That was about two years ago. And I said, what a great thought for a sermon Sunday. And I put it away. And I thought, okay, because the, the, the idea, it can look that it comes from the same place, and yet the end game of being buried or planted is tremendously different. And I said, there is not a greater story about who God is and what he does with our lives than that idea and that concept of being buried or planted. And so we see in John chapter 12, in verse 20, it says, Now some Greeks were among those who had gone up to worship at the feast. So these approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and requested, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went, uh, went and told Andrew, and they both went and told Jesus. Jesus replied, The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the solemn truth. Now, we all know Jesus only spoke truth. As a matter of fact, so much so, he was the truth, right? But whenever he prefaces a statement with, I tell you the truth, it's time to listen, pay attention, highlight, italicize, embolden, uh, whatever you want to do to say, this is an important dynamic here. Unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And the idea there is, in order for us <coughs> to be ultimately what God wants us to be, God was saying, we've got to die. And the context here is <coughs> to give up your own life. And he says, if you try to keep your life, you will actually lose it. One of the paradoxical nature of Christianity. If you actually want to keep your life, you will lose it. If you actually try to lose your life, that's how you will gain it. And we can sit down and talk a little bit more about that if you would like. But certainly, that is a concept that is in the scripture. That idea of dying. Of being planted. I believe that that is God's vision for us as individuals and us on a corporate level. One of the things that we are about here in the Ottawa church <coughs> is that we are a missional church. What does that mean? That we are about helping people who don't understand Christ and the gospel message is to help them to understand how much God loves them and the redeeming grace that God has offered to all of us. And that our mission and our goal is to do that. And it's not namely to come here on Sunday mornings and to worship God. And that's great. That's awesome. But there's an end game to this. That we don't remain only a single kernel. But that it becomes many. This concept is found in the scriptures throughout. You cannot read the scriptures and not see this idea. Even Jesus says, of course, <coughs> my goal is that you will produce 20, 30, even 100 times. The idea that it is the most selfish, it is the most nearsighted thing for us to find out how to get our sins forgiven and not shared with others. There is not a more selfish thing 
than that. To find out, man, where there is world starvation and we have found where to get food and this food never ends. There's not a limited supply. You ever go, you go to No Frills, limited supply, only two cans of Coke, you can, whatever, you know, it's on sale. Limited four, so, so, uh, limited four per family. No such thing with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet that's what we're about and occasionally we fall short. We get caught up. And interestingly, sometimes I know this intellectually, it's painful when you actually see it in front of your eyes. In some of the discussions I've had, I understand why people don't like relig organized religion. Because we messed it up. And I understand, I said, wow, this is why people don't want to come to an organized place or that is seemingly organized. I've talked to some people whose spouse is not a disciple and, and not part of the congregation. says, I can't understand some of the things that's going on. This is such a great place, but why do we bring in all our dirty laundry so that everybody could see it? Let's deal with it. And if we don't come to the realization these are some things that we've got to deal with, we're going to be buried and not be a church that blossoms and that is planted. But I don't know about you. I am not about being buried. I am 51 years old. I don't know how much longer I have on this earth. Anytime you go to a funeral, you, are under, you understand the fragility of life, the finality of death. And you, re you ask yourself some questions. What are you going to live for? And I know one of it is not to be part of a quibbling congregation. I know that's not one of it. And yet, when Melly and I were thinking about coming to Ottawa, so many people said to her, have you lost your mind? It's so cold there. <coughs> I don't think Andrea told me the absolute truth. She tells me it doesn't get, like, it barely goes up below 30 or something like that. Is that what you said, Andrea? No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> they, they weren't talking about the weather. Amelia and I said, listen, what we don't need to know more about is that the fact that there are people here, in spite of challenges, that they're still here. I don't need to know more. I'm willing, we're willing to come. In spite of these challenges, and yet to remain in that state perpetually, I think would be a, a, an issue. And hopefully, as we're looking at God and as we're looking that he's, we're gonna realize that he's a God that is worthy of our worship. And I look forward to when we come to worship service. That somebody's tapping me on the shoulder and says, Tom, it's 10, 20. And somebody's saying, why can't we start singing now? Why are we wasting time? I remember Melanie and I, uh, got introduced to a couple and they said, hey, um, we would like, we got to know you guys, we would like for you to do some premarital counseling. And they were not members of the congregation in Boston. I said, we would love to do that, of course. But we can only use the scriptures because that's what we know to be most effective. Long story short, six weeks later, they got baptized into Christ and then we performed their marriage. The woman said, when she would come to church, Tony, why are we done so early? 
This is a minute, an hour, and 50 minutes later, and the service is done, and she's saying, why are we done so early? I can't get enough of this. Then I would receive emails from you guys saying, Tony, that was service was way too short. That we can't wait to be together. Why are we only meeting on Sundays and occasionally during the week? Why can't we get together more often? That's the idea. You know, some of the epic battles that I'm going to be talking about, actually, interestingly, and perhaps providentially, the, these were going to be standalone sermons. But I realize almost every one of these epic battles has this idea of someone being left for dead or buried, and yet God used them. We think about David and Goliath, for example. David literally was shunned as the shepherd and the youngest child in his family. As a matter of fact, when they came to choose a king, they looked and looked, and the guy saw some people who were big and tall, and, and yet Samuel said, I haven't yet found the guy. And only when he went to the desert to find David did he realize this is the man that I'm looking for. He was left there to mind the sheep, buried in the desert, if you would. And yet, as we read about David's history, he said that, hey, listen, when I was a shepherd boy, I slew a lion with my hands, and one day I was just bored, and I just went and saw uh, in a snowy pit this animal, and I just killed him. And it trained my hands to be what I needed to be. You, I was left here because I was not, because I was the youngest, and perhaps did not think that I could do anything to the Philistine army. And yet God went and picked him up and chose him. And I am here to tell you that I do not believe that the last 24 years, or however long you've been part of the Ottawa Church, 10 years, 5 years, 7 years, 6 weeks, that that history was for naught. That it was not, that God is not going to use it to say, okay, now we have learned some lessons and it's time for us to blossom as he did with David. As David's history was used to empower and give him confidence and faith that he could indeed slay the Goliath that was standing right before them when everyone was cowering in fear. He said, who is this Philistine that intimidates the armies of the living God. And him being buried and left for dead or not being thought of. Instead, his history was used as an opportunity to say, what have I learned? And so today, the question begs of you and I, as we stand at the precipice of a new year, to ask ourselves this question, are we going to lament or are we going to learn? Our recent history. You know, it was one of the impetus for why Melly and I decided to go back into the ministry. <clears throat> we said, what have we learned over the last few years? And here we are in sweltering 105 degrees in San Antonio. What are we going to do with what we have learned? Am I going <clears> to <throat> just keep it in and say, oh, well, I've learned? 
a lot and I'm going to keep it to myself. A lot of people ask, well, what are you guys going to do when you go back to, to Ottawa? I don't know. I know it's not formulaic. I know it's not do these three things and then these five things are going to happen. You know, for the longest time in my life, I tried to put a formula to God. I said, if I did this, if I prayed these things, things and, and if I fasted for this long and if I walked this long and then if I shaved my head and or, or if I left my head, I don't know, whatever. And I realize in the scriptures throughout time, so much is contextual. There are times that God expected us to just get up and go and there are other times he wants us for, to pray about it. There are times he says, you know, it's okay to slay the enemy. And there are other times he rebukes us when we slay the enemies. There are times when he says for us, and, and, and it's always comical to me now, is when I look someone, and it wasn't always comical, uh, but when I look at someone, say, I've, I've, I figured out the code. I, I've seen the code. Of, really? You think God wants us to, that this is a jigsaw puzzle that he's trying for us to figure out? So ridiculous. One tap what? I mean, there are times he needs us there. Sometimes he doesn't need us. Sometimes he uses a donkey. <laughs> there are times when David was, when he slew the Slew the giant with a, with a sling slot shot. And yet when James and John was trying to call them proper, they said, what, what are you doing? Yeah. Peter tried to use a sword to slash the air. And God just said, what, what are you doing? Yeah. And so the idea, when someone asked me, I said, I don't know. But I want to be faithful to him. Or we think about Joseph. When Joseph was left for dead in a cistern, his brothers literally left him for dead. They were conscious stricken. They figured, that, let's kill him. <laughs> One of them, somehow they thought it was probably better. Hey, let, no, let's not kill him. Let's put him in the cistern. Let's leave him for dead, but let's not kill him with our own hands. That somehow that was better. Implicit dead was better than explicit death, I guess, in this case. It's crazy, right? And they left him for dead. Not once. Many times in his life he was left for dead, even in, in the jail. When he was forgotten. And yet God used him and he blossomed wherever he was and ultimately, ultimately was the man and because of what he had done led the mass exodus out of Egypt. And instead of turning bitter, we'll, we'll close with that section, he was most gracious in his way because he understood, listen, man has nothing on me. I was not buried, I was planted. I was not buried, I was planted. And so the challenges that you go through in your life, it depends on our perspective and what we think about them and how we use those things in our lives. We think about Samson and Delilah. It's one of the epic battles we're going to have, right? That whole time. And he thought it was funny the way he lived his life. And then he, in a moment of weakness, he shared where his strength came from. And they cut his hair. And he was left in prison, and he was left for dead. And God used that moment in time to refine Samson's life. And the Bible says literally in one day, 
he killed more Philistines than he did for the rest of his life. To defeat his enemy. I don't know what struggles you have. I know you have them. Because I have a camera in your home and I see all. <laughs> no, all I have to do is look in the mirror, right? I see most of you are nodding your head, yes. I don't understand that, but I, uh, <laughs> no, but all we have to do is realize, man, we have, we have major issues. But the question begs, today, 2019, January 6th, is that something that God is going to use? And then ultimately you can say, I was planted, I wasn't buried. Oh, I was left for dead. Oh, I was left for dead. Or literally, the story of Jesus. When he was left for dead on the cross, and yet it was God's greatest victory. It was his greatest victory when Nebuchadnezzar put Daniel in the lion's den, that he wanted to kill him, to leave him for dead. And yet, it was one of the most momentous occasions that we're talking about it today. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they wanted to burn them and kill them and leave them for dead. And yet, it's one of the most epic battles found in the scriptures. Is that going to be our story, church? Or are we going to be relegated to obscurity because of our unwillingness to trust God and to see that we are indeed planted and not buried? You know, I'll share with you a little bit personally. I went into the ministry upon graduation from the University of Toronto. I was accepted to a very limited enrollment program, the Law MBA program at the University of Toronto. I decided to go into the ministry instead. My parents thought I was nuts. Making $800 a month, Not for one month, for the entire year. 25 years later, I was out of the ministry. And I had to ask myself a question. When, was I going to blame everybody and not take responsibility for my own life and the direction of decisions I make? Or was I going to be a scapegoater? where I scapegoat people. Decision I had to make. When people who were in the ministry telling me, don't go back into the ministry. You look happier, you look so much more, you can do so much more. I said, I'm not going to the ministry or what I can do, what I can't do. I believe I'm responding to what God wants me to do. And I don't mean to sound arrogant, but that's, that, that's what I'm doing. And I know if you're anything like me, there are things that happen to us or that sometimes we happen to. And it leaves moments in our, in our lives where we are hurt. And we ask ourselves, is it worth it? And I have to answer the question, Am I then going to use the last 25 years and not make it work for me? You understand what I mean? That I'm not going to that I am suddenly going to give away the lessons that I learned in those times over the last few years, over the last couple of decades, and I'm going to give way to Satan and say, "Hey, listen, hey man, 
cool, you learned those lessons, now don't help others with it. Keep it to yourself and you'll be a happier person. And you see, we gotta ask ourselves these questions. It's gonna determine, are you buried or were you planted? About these epic battles, do you think we will tell the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or of Daniel today, if they did not realize how God was working in their lives, and they were not, when they were left for dead, and they could have had so much self-pity in their lives. And that's not at all diminishing what we go through in life, but the idea, are we gonna look through the filter of God? There are temptations in my life when I want to blame somebody else for my issues. And yet, even though I know intellectually I will never give someone that power, that you can have that power over my life, whether or not you like me or you don't like me should affect the way I live. Am I going to give you that power? And yet sometimes we, if we're human beings, we fall into that, right? We, who doesn't want to be liked? I want to be liked. Please like me. <laughs> but if it controls what I do and how I please my God, then it's problematic, right? It's why we do things in life. It's why we dress the way we do, we comb the hair. We, because we want for somebody to say, okay, I accept you at least. Buried or planted, what are we going to be? And the math tells me, perhaps in a year, we will not all be here. Why? Because I, no, I, I don't know. Well, that's what the math tells me. But we're, with God's help, are planning to write a story in the annals of Christianity that while we were left for dead, God used it to show the epic battle that can be won when we surrender to God. And so this morning, what I wanted to do is to infuse in your heart and in your mind a vision of what God is going to do. And I'm telling you, there's not, nothing magical about Melanie and I. There's no magic touch. I wish we did. It would have already been waved or, or touched or whatever I needed to do. Abracadabra, big, the big cur, cur. The ultimate thing is that we look to our God, and, and if we are not doing what we need to be doing, are we going to be one of the people who were left in the desert that God needed the Israelites to wander, even though he rescued them from Egypt, they needed to wander in the desert for 40 years, so a generation who did not trust him would die in the desert? Only Joshua and Caleb of that old generation and the ones who were younger were allowed to flow, go into the land flowing with milk and honey because even though they were rescued from Egypt, they were pantheistic. They were, some of them were atheistic and did not believe in the one true God. And so I'm not talking about us here as individuals. Amen. But I'm talking at up us as a corporate church. And I shared with you, not because I had nothing else to say, that I was not going to come to Ottawa simply to have another church in Ottawa, because there are many of them. But unless we become a church that loves like Jesus, that we can't wait to get here. When somebody comes in, they're going to say, get away from me, man. You're just crowding me too much.
I remember when my son Michael and I at times would get into arguments. Okay, let's say it mildly. There are times when he said, Dad, I hate you. I remember one time I said to him, but I love you for the both of us. I really do. Today, I could not script a relationship with my son. And even if I were to write it, I could not write it as lovely as it is today. I couldn't. It will be too lofty of a dream. Yet, we went through our challenges. But the other side, I realize now, it was planted. It blossomed. So let me ask you your question. Are you going to let Satan use the last little while in your life and the lessons that you've learned go for naught? Or are we going to do something here? And so the idea is that we're scraping away what needs to be scraped away. We're looking to God that he'll trust us and that we will ultimately trust him. And that we are heading on this journey to look at these battles and to realize this God is awesome. That we got to get the first thing first. This is not, we're not, we're gonna, we're not gonna play church. We don't want to have all the bells and whistles and yet nothing on the inside. Oh, we're going to have bells and whistles eventually, but they're going to have their place. But if this is not taken care of, if they didn't need to live in the desert, if you would, for 40 years and eat manna from heaven for a while and get that in place first, and God told them when they left Egypt, they said, only one thing I want you to do, remember me. They didn't. And there needs to be a recalling of our hearts of why do we do what we do? Why are we surrendered to Christ? You know, as we think about the Lord's Supper, as we're thinking about this epic battle that was won, They took Christ, and they thought, okay, for once and for all, we're burying him. We're putting him away. We're going to slay this cult that has started, this Messiah following this guy, both the Romans and the Jew and the religious people. They, we're going to end it right now, only to realize that by burying him, they actually planted something that, intent that eventually rocked the Roman Empire without a, a, a sword being drawn. That their lifestyle was such that they were planted wherever they went. And when they tried to kill them and they persecuted them, you know what the scripture says happened? They only spread the gospel all over. That the gospel was planted wherever they were scattered. Wow! They tried to destroy them, but you can't destroy that which is indestructible. That's what God says about the kingdom. You cannot destroy the kingdom. The question is, what part of that kingdom are we going to be the tapestry of it? They tried to leave him for dead, Christ, in the tomb. And yet, what it turned out to be was the most inspiring thing for his followers. Think about that. They tried to squeeze it out. I think that's what Satan tried to do with us. But you said no. I know it's challenging. I know it's difficult. But I will not give up.
In Genesis, we'll close with this scripture. In Genesis chapter 50, we read about the story of Joseph. And the brothers realize, oh my goodness, Joseph is not dead. It says in verse nine, uh, chapter 50, verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge and wants to repay us in full for all the harm we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father gave these instructions before he died. Tell Joseph, please forgive the son of your brothers and the wrong they did when they treated you so badly. Now please forgive them the sin of the servants of the God of your father. When the message was reported to them, Joseph wept. Then his brothers came and threw themselves down before him and they said, here we are, we are your slaves. But Joseph answered, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant to harm me. But God intended it for a good purpose so that he could preserve the lives of many people as you can see this day. So now, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. Then he consoled them and spoke kindly to them. Is there a more gracious encounter in the scriptures? These brothers were so scared about what happened. They start saying, hey, by the way, Joseph, your dad said you need to forgive us. <laughs> and Joseph looked at them and said, listen, am I in the place of God? I forgive you. Oh, you intended it for harm? But God has used it for the saving of many lives. You know, I look out on the crowd and I can see all of, some, some of us have gone through death in our family. We've had significant conflicts in relationships, physical health, emotional health, spiritual health. Satan tried to use these things to destroy us. How do we know that God has not put you in a situation so that you can blossom and help and love and serve? If we have a view that we have been planted and not buried, that's the purview that we have. What Satan intended for harm God has used for the saving of many lives. And so I know we put some of this stuff in Facebook and I, I really don't care. I care about this group. I care about where we were at in the context of the Ottawa church and where we need to go. And so today, this morning, as we embark on 2019, as we look at some epic battles, we have to answer the question, have you been buried or have you been planted? And the only way we will know the answer to that question is how we view our challenges through God's eyes or woe is me eyes. I am so thrilled so thrilled about the future of the Ottawa Church. And my wife and I were sharing. She said, honey, if you didn't have those challenges with Michael, I'm not sure your relationship would be like, like it is now. When we write the history of the Ottawa Church, we're going to talk about these days. Remember when? Let me tell you my story. And you're not, oh, you're over the story, you're not coloring the story. It doesn't look pretty. You share your story and you say, this is what God did in and amongst us. What are we going to do for our 25th anniversary? I know it's not going to be here. 
I know we're going to be here much longer. So church, as we embark on the next few months, as we look at these epic battles, and we see how God wants to blossom us, let us give thanks for that ultimately that we can give thanks to our God who was left for dead in the tomb and yet had his greatest victory. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful. We're so grateful to you. Thank you that even though you were left for dead, it was your greatest moment of victory. And we are the recipients and beneficiaries of that blossoming. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Father and I thank you for the disciples here today. The Father, we will understand that indeed we have been planted and are not left for dead by you. Maybe by the world, but not by you. Thank you for your death because it meant life for us. Thank you for this bread that is emblematic of your son's body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.